Good evening, all, and welcome to the fifth annual City of Worcester State of the Lakes events. I'm really excited to see some familiar faces here. Um, thank you all for attending. I'm also really excited to see so many new names and faces, and I welcome you. Um, before we begin tonight, um, I'm going to let our mayor, Mayor Joe Petty, um, open open things up. I just want to thank uh, Jacqueline for having me here to speak tonight. Uh, you and your team and the sustainability team and DPW do a wonderful job. So keep up the great work and make a difference here in the city of Worcester. You know, earlier today, uh, the city manager and I joined Congress from the government and members of the state delegation to celebrate $500,000 earmark for the Mass Audubon received from the, from the APA funds. And uh, this project, if you think about it, is a microcosm of our entire blue space program, uh, space program. Generations ago, that stream was channelized and strained to make room for a soil line. Now, if the Route 20 project, that soil line that used to flow, outflow into the Broad Meadow Brook has been capped, this project is a chance to recreate new wetlands and allow the stream to return to a more natural state. In essence, we are fixing the problems that were created by prior generations. And this project is recreating the natural state of this brook before it was channelized and the soil line was installed. Like all our urban waterways, our lakes and ponds and streams, Broadmeadow Brook is a truly a gem in our city of Worcester. And uh, our blue spaces are part of the natural world that exists within our city's boundaries and does so much for our community. From summer camp for our children to after school and enrichment programs, these are spaces for fishing, boating, and rowing. And everybody probably knows that Lake Wissing is probably one of the best rowing lakes here in the city, in the uh, country. So, you know, as we build a more resilient city in the face of the changing climate, the value, the value of our wetlands and uh, our blue spaces are becoming clear. These spaces are meant to be filled with water and flood periodically. They collect snow melt and rain water, purified runoff from our roads, and provide breeding grounds for the amphibians and feeding grounds for our birds. These are spaces that improve our livability and quality of life in our city. Uh, blue spaces are an economic and recreational opportunity that we need to continue investing in and to unlock the potential that th these spaces represent. And I just want to thank the manager too and the uh, committee. You know, 2.5 million, I think, of opera money for the, was the green, was the plan implementation. And some of that money will go to uh, funding disease, water quality impacts of our climate change, maintaining the cleansiness of our reservoirs, and enhancing our blue space. I do want to thank the manager and his team, and and uh, you're making a difference here. Who knows? We did the blue space, Jackie, a few years ago. This was new, and you really stepped up the plate. And uh, now you have a team of two, and you're doing great. So keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mayor Petty, you want to? We also have our city manager here, uh, Mr. Edward Augustus. Well, thank you, Jackie, and I want to thank the mayor. You know, the mayor really deserves a lot of credit. This was his idea back six years ago. Said, "Hey, we need to start focusing on all of our bodies of water in the city that are not part of our drinking water system, but are part of our quality of life, our habitat, our recreational opportunities." And quite honestly, we weren't being good stewards uh, of those bodies of water and. You know, the idea was born to create this blue space initiative. And uh, I have to say, we made the perfect hire uh, in Jackie because uh, we got somebody who's not only passionate about this work, but is so knowledgeable and such a, a team builder. Uh, she's not only built teams within different city departments that are supporting her work, but with all of you, watershed associations and neighbors and environmentalists and just concerned citizens have all kind of rally to the cause uh, and really supported uh, Jackie and now Nick uh, as part of the team. And uh, every year since this program has been established, we've expanded its budget and we've added to its team. And I expect that to be the case in the budget that I'll be recommending to the city council in May, uh, that we're gonna continue to prioritize this with tax levy dollars and now also supplementing it with our opera funds, uh, which are, is a new great resource. Uh, and as the mayor said, we have committed at least $2.5 million of the opera funds to support environmental initiatives, including our blue space initiative. Uh, so the other big thing that's happened since the last state of this 
uh, Lakes address is uh, I recommended the city council in last year's budget and they supported it, creating a department of sustainability and resiliency. We did a green Worcester plan um, and I, I should back up one step. So the city council declared climate uh, change an emergency. And as a result of that, my administration uh, worked with consultants and a team of residents and city staff, and we created a green Worcester plan. Uh, and then we created a department with several uh, positions. I think we're up to six or seven positions now that work full time on making that green Worcester plan a reality. And we moved the blue space initiative from the DPW over to uh, the resiliency uh, and sustainability office. Uh, even though DPW remains a great partner with, and an essential partner on this work, uh, we thought there was a, a even better alignment with the work of implementing the Green Worcester Plan. Uh, and I think we're gonna also be expanding the number of bodies of water uh, that are covered by the Blue Space uh, Initiative. We have four uh, that were the initial uh, four, uh, Bell Pond, Lake Quinsigamon, uh, Coes Pond, and Indian Lake. Uh, and I think we're gonna be expanding several more bodies of water to be part of our regular testing, uh, and planning uh, regiment uh, so that we are covering more of our blue space and being better stewards. So I think that's good news. And I think as a reflection of not only my strong support, but, but more importantly, the city council's strong support of this initiative and the importance of uh, this for the quality of life and, and us being responsible stewards of these great environmental assets that we have. And I guess I just mentioned parenthetically before I turn it back to Jackie, we are also uh, putting some investments in some of the recreational spaces around these bodies of water. Uh, if you look at what we've done at Shore Park, and we're now pursuing a land and water conservation grant uh, to do that, to do over Clayson Beach, uh, to do a new bathhouse and a new uh, kind of design of the beach and the area there so that there are more recreational opportunities and access uh, to uh, Indian Lake from a different kind of vantage point. Coes Pond, we took a former, um, you know, contaminated site, the old Coes Knife site that was abandoned in a dumping location. We moved one of the most historic buildings in the city there, Stearns Tavern, opened it, saved that important part of our history, built a universally accessible playground uh, there, uh, and now we're putting walkways that connect to Coes, uh, to Columbus Park and to the field there. So there's more passive recreation as well as the playground, the historic tavern. And you can see if you drive down Mill Street that we're doing more work on Benenda Beach. We redid the bathhouse. Uh, we created accessibility to the beach. Now we're expanding the footprint of the beach and we're adding a canoe and kayak launch there uh, for more recreational opportunities on Coes Pond. Uh, and lastly, as part of the ARPA funds, we are recommending redoing Bell Pond uh, Beach. Uh, we'll redo the bathhouse, uh, redo the beach there. So we are trying to cook on all burners, if you will, uh, not only uh, paying attention to the recreational access points uh, to these bodies of water, but also uh, paying attention to the quality of the water uh, and allowing it to sustain you know, the wildlife uh, and the habitat, but also the recreational needs of the city. Uh, and in about two weeks, I'll be sending into the city council a set of recommendations around uh, our summer uh, plans. And the, we'll have a new configuration for security and safety that was an issue last year uh, to really try to make sure that uh, all of our recreational assets are fully accessible this summer. Uh, and so I think hopefully that'll be good news for folks who are anxious to use these bodies of water in a ways that are safe and appropriate. So thank you to everybody for what you do and uh, look forward to hearing more from Jackie and, and Nick and the team. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. City Manager. I um, appreciate all um, you all for being here. I also wanna recognize that we have a few city councilors here tonight, Councilor Merrill Carlson, Councilor Rose and Councilor Russell. Um, are all joining us. And so thank you for your support of the program. Um, and without further ado, we will jump right in. All right. So um, 
as a lot of you probably already know, my name is Jacqueline Burmeister and I am the coordinator of the Lakes and Ponds program here in Worcester. And we hold the state of the lakes every year to provide an update to our residents about water quality and the projects that we have in store for you to keep our blue spaces beautiful. I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Nick Pagan, who collected a lot of the data that we're gonna be reviewing. Nick will be keeping an eye on the chat if you have any questions. Um, during the presentation, but we'll also have a chance to unmute and ask them at various points throughout the presentation as well. So whatever you feel more comfortable doing. Um, unfortunately, this is our second virtual State of the Lakes. Previous to last year, we would actually get together in person at the Blackstone Visitor Center. This is a space that celebrates how the waters of Worcester were so formative in our history, providing the power to the factories that put Worcester on the map. The irony of being here virtually is that today our lakes and ponds value is in the recreational opportunities that they're providing to us as residents. These opportunities to get outside and gather safely during a period when gathering elsewhere was a little more risky. And how lucky we are. 20 or more. <laughs> lakes and ponds in one city. What New Yorker could rent a paddleboard and glide for miles up and down a lake like Lake Quinsigamond? What Bostonian could windsurf across a lake like Indian? What Philadelphian could splash around in crystal clear waters like Bell Pond? Is anyone in Springfield fishing out of a canoe on the tranquil reservoir like Coase? How many urbanites could do that without living, leaving their city? city? How many could do that without even getting into the car? These recreational opportunities do so much to improve the quality of life of our residents, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Because let's remember that for so many of Worcester, leaving Worcester to recreate is not an option. For many in Worcester, getting into a car isn't even an option. So this year, as the manager mentioned, the Lakes and Ponds program was moved from the Department of Public Works and Ponds to the Department of Sustainability and Resilience. This department was created to implement the Green Worcester Plan with the goal of making Worcester the greenest mid-sized city in the country. And being a green city certainly includes livability elements such as these opportunities. But if we're thinking about making our city green, there's a lot more that our blue spaces provide than just recreation. There are many other benefits or ecosystem services that lakes provide to humans. There are services that they provide by just existing. For example, this past October, Arts Worcester and Preservation Worcester put on an exhibit of landscapes by local artists that all features Worcester's green and blue spaces. This is a beautiful rendition of Curtis Pond in Hadwin Park by Jane Mistretta. You can see the awe that she had for this place. The inspiration to produce art in, is an existence service that gives us, that lakes give us just by being there. Other existence services include things Things like using lakes as science classrooms for students and researchers. They also provide habitat services. Blue spaces provide wildlife habitat, which is service for birds, fish, and animals who may otherwise not feel quite as home in the city. And finally, lakes and ponds provide supportive and regulating services for our urban ecosystem, helping, helping to dampen the heat sink effect, um, their sinks for carbon, I'm sorry, the heat island effects, their sinks for carbon, they assist in nutrient cycling, offering flood protection. These services now more than ever are crucial in our city. And while it may not be easy to put a price tag on these services, try as we might, we have not been able to create man-made alternatives that are gonna perform all of these functions. And the one or two that we're able to replicate, well, they're really not cheap. The lakes gift us these things for free, but life in the city is also stressful to lakes, just like it can be for humans. And because of that, our lakes need a little extra care to stay healthy so that they can continue to provide these services. And that is where the Lakes and Ponds program comes in. The mission of the Lakes and Ponds program is to monitor and manage our waterways for the threats, for threats and preserve these ecosystem services. And we're here tonight to share how, with you how we did just that. Tonight, we're gonna to be covering three topics. We're gonna to begin our presentation with an overview of our accomplishments in 2021. Second, we're going to provide a summary of the water quality monitoring results for our program lakes. And then we're gonna finish 
with a preview of our exciting projects that we have in store for 2022. It was a tremendous year of growth for the program and we have a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. In order to carry out our mission, the Lakes and Ponds program has three core tasks. Water quality monitoring, where we visit our lakes and collect the data needed to assess how healthy they are. Lake management, where we implement projects to improve fish health or lake health. And education and outreach, where we share our findings and empower our residents to use and keep these spaces beautiful. Previous to 2021, all three of these tasks were taken on by a single person. So probably the biggest driver of our growth this year was being able to hire another environmental analyst who took on a majority of the water quality monitoring in addition to providing support and outreach for outreach and education programming. So for those of you who have not met him, this is Nick Pagan. This past summer, he was very busy. He went out to our four program lakes 61 times between May and October, and even longer on Lake Quinsigamon. While out there, he was collecting data on the status of our lakes. Nick took 306 rounds of probe measurements for temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, and secchi clarity. He also took over 600 water quality samples to be analyzed for total phosphorus, ammonia, nitrate, total suspended solids, total dissolved phosphorus, E. coli. All of these are indicators of lake health. He did all this following our state approved sampling plan and was diligent about quality assurance and quality control. He therefore took hundreds of duplicate samples to ensure that the readings he was getting were consistent. He tested our methods and the laboratories with field and equipment blanks, basically sending in blind samples of pure water to make sure we weren't getting false positives. While we've always felt that our sampling plan has been robust, we feel confident that our 2021 data set has the highest level of quality that we've had in the last five years. And we didn't stop with just collecting it. We analyzed it and we reported it to our local watershed associations as we received it and used it to drive and review our management plans. This winter, we've been working on creating accessible reports on with each water body that includes all of the data we've collected, which will be available on the Lakes and Ponds website by the end of next week. In addition to improving our existing data collection, 2021 was the first year that we've been able to quantify litter. Over the years, we've identified litter as being a threat to our lake's health and recreational value. However, unlike the other water quality monitoring parameters that we've just listed, litter is a lot harder to classify and quantify, and therefore more difficult to track over time. And when something can't be quantified and tracked, it's harder to determine how to manage it and if those management techniques are working. So this past year, we were privileged to work with several students from WPI to develop a tool to quantify litter at our public spaces. The students determined a classification system that used two sets of metrics, one that included overall condition of the park for various aspects of usability, and one that characterized litter itself. They assigned different categories scores that could be compared over time. And while still being developed, we are able to share with you some of the initial results of this effort tonight and plan to continue to refine the methodologies to help us inform our litter management. This year, we've also increased our cyanobacteria monitoring. Cyanobacteria are microscopic organisms that use light and simple nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen for food. While naturally occurring in all environments, under the right conditions, they can explode in population and cause harmful cyanobacteria blooms, or HCBs. These usually manifest themselves in green tinted water or surface scums on a lake. HCBs are harmful for two main reasons. When all of the biomass dies, the dead cells are decomposed by bacteria, which use a lot of dissolved oxygen to the point where they could deplete all of the oxygen in the water, causing fish kills. But even more concerning is that some kinds of cyanobacteria can produce harmful toxins that affect dogs, wildlife, and even humans. For this reason, at certain water bodies, we collect cell counts to determine if the concentration in the water is safe and inform our cyanobacteria management plan. This year, we took 13 cell counts at Coes, 17 at Indian Lake, and two at Lake Quinsigamond. 
This year, we researched more the potential of using continuous monitoring buoys to collect data. While our twice monthly visits are good at helping us determine patterns at most of our local lakes, Lake Quinsigamond's size and unique bathymetry make it more of a challenge to get an accurate reading of what is going on in real time. For that reason, we've been testing continuous monitoring technology in two portions of the lake. Our continuous monitors are two frisbee sized solar powered buoys that we've placed in the deep basins of Lake Quinsigamond, where they're detecting temperature, turbidity, as well as indicators of algae and cyanobacteria. They're doing it every 30 minutes, 24 hours a day, and transferring that data in real time. We began developing these, deploying these buoys in the summer of 2020, making Lake Quinsigamond the first lake in the region with this kind of monitoring technology. At the end of 2021, we had a robust data set of internal data to compare the results to and are confident that these technologies will be able to alert us if there are any unusual activities at the lake that require our attention. And we're also excited for the possibility to begin to use these, these buoys at other locations. But we can't rely on these sensors for all of our data. And given how many water bodies Worcester has, it can be a challenge to monitor them all with precision and accuracy with a team of just two people. So for this reason, we look forward to opportunities to work with the community to collect high quality data. In 2019, we teamed up with the Lake Quinsigamon Watershed Association to develop a state approved bacteria monitoring plan for the lake that has been followed since then. In 2021, they trained an intern to collect 10 rounds of bacteria samples from 13 locations on the lake for the third year running. This data was submitted to the city and the town of Shrewsbury and will be submitted to the Department of Environmental Protection. If you're interested in learning about what they found, you can see their full reports on lqwa.org. With all of this data, we're able to better understand the dynamics of these water bodies and the threats to their well being. We're going to now talk briefly about some of the management action that we did in order to address some of the challenges that they face. One of the major threats to the health of our recreation and the recreational value of our lakes are invasive aquatic plants. These weeds threaten to overtake our lakes, crowding out local flora and fauna and causing oxygen depletion as they die back in the fall. To monitor, we use annual to semi-annual surveys of our water bodies to check for new invasives and determine the extent of the in existing infestation. Because invasive plants are diverse and have different life cycles, there's no single solution for getting rid of them. In the city, we adapt our management plan annually using a variety of approaches for treating our invasives in an efficient, safe, and environmentally friendly fashion. All of our plans are approved by the local and state conservation commission and have been discussed with the local watershed associations. We will talk more about the specific invasives when we summarize water quality at each lake. And as always, these plans will be adapted to reflect conditions in 2022. We also manage several water bodies for cyanobacteria. In the lakes and ponds that our monitoring has determined to be at high risk for harmful cyanobacteria blooms, we've developed management plans with the goal of keeping cyanobacteria's numbers in safe ranges. In 2021, we use in the combination of aluminum sulfate and copper sulfate to successfully keep cyanobacteria at safe levels in Coe's Reservoir for the entire season, as well as the entire swimming season at Indian Lake. However, um, we're not prepared for a spike in cyanobacteria that occurred at a rainy period at Indian Lake that caused the closure for two weeks in mid-September. We'll talk more about cyanobacteria at both of these locations later in the presentation. We also want to address a recent uptick in the number of beach closures due to fecal bacteria threshold exceedances and anecdotal evidence pointed at goose droppings to be the main culprit. We know that geese usually enter the beach from the water and are not good at getting over even low fences. Additionally, they're uncomfortable when there are barriers between the beach and the water because the water is their escape route from land predators. By constructing a small fence between the shore and the water during evening hours, we found that the use of the beach by the geese was significantly reduced. And while not a perfect solution, our goose fencing pilot project was a huge success to improve upon in 2022. In 2021, we installed some permanent infrastructure to improve water quality. One way to clean up our lakes is to prevent nutrients and bacteria from getting into them into the first, in the first place. We know that stormwater is one of the major contributors of these contaminants, and so we're always looking for ways that we can intercept 
and filter the stormwater before it gets there. Last spring, we constructed a biofiltration unit off Lake Ave North on Lake Quinsigamon, right next to Coal Mine Brook, a major tributary to the lake. This unit will filter runoff from Lake Ave North through plantings, mulch, and high-performance media before releasing it into the lake. You can check out the installation at the beginning of the East West Trail and learn more about why we care about stormwater at the educational placard there. We plan to continue to look for opportunities to filter stormwater and educate the public about water quality in 2022. But despite all this, despite all the work we do with city employees, there is only so much of an impact that we can make without the support of the community. Not only do we want to let people know about the state of their lake and what we're doing to improve these spaces, but we want to inform people how they can help keep these blue spaces beautiful and why they should care to do so. We do this through traditional written materials, signage, social media, but with our added capacity in 2021, we are also able to reach more people through programming. The Angler event series was a wonderful success story for programming in our blue spaces. This series was conceived by three local watershed associations, those of Indian Lake, Tatnik Brook, and Lake Quinsigamon. They were all looking for a way to engage more stakeholders in the importance of lake water quality. And so in collaboration with the city of Worcester, various other local and state organizations, not the least of which was Mass Wildlife, a huge contributor to this effort, well, we put together the 2021 Blue Space Angler Event Series. This was 13 programs over the course of 2021 that celebrated fishing and the connections between healthy waters and healthy fisheries. Events were both virtual and socially distanced in-person events aimed at all knowledge levels, including topics as diverse as learning to ice fish to local wild trout fisheries, population, or local wild trout populations and biology of fly fishing. Overall, the series was a huge success and we had hundreds of participants, many of whom were learning about the Lakes and Ponds program for the very first time. In fact, one event, Ice Safety and Fishing, was so popular that we held it again this year, earlier this month. If you missed it and you're interested, we were able to post many of the online presentations on our website for the series, wooanglerseries.com. Which brings us to an order of business. One of the final events of the series was called Fish Tales, Stories of Fishing in the Heart of the Commonwealth. This event aimed to promote Worcester as a fun place to fish and encourage people to share their fish tales and photos of their catches in different categories. And tonight we are excited to be sharing the winners of that contest. The first award is the Biggest Fish Award, and it goes to Jeff Pieria for this beautiful pike that he pulled through the ice at Indian Lake. We also have two small fry awards, David and Jason, shown here with their catches of large mouse bass. In addition, we had Jonathan Morales, who won the category of Sounds Like a Tall Tale, Chad Whitcomb won the funniest story, and Jeff also won our best story. We will be contacting all of the winners via email this week to come and pick up their prizes, which have been provided through Mass Wildlife, Shrewsbury Parks and Rec, and Ben's Pack Tackle Shop. The purpose of this event was to highlight the fishing opportunities in the city of Worcester and get people excited about protecting these resources. And as such, these stories and photos will be on display at City Hall during the third week of March, so you can go and check them out there. And finally, one of the things that we're most proud of in 2022 was the expansion of the Worcester Cyanobacteria Monitoring Program, a group of volunteer community scientists that are trained to collect water quality samples and analyze them for potential of harmful bacteria, cyanobacteria blooms. This year, the number of lakes in the program grew by 100%, from 11 to 22 lakes with over 35 volunteers. With the help of our new employee, and our full time and a full time intern from WPI and the dedication of these residents, we are able to develop even more robust sample set and begin to provide real time data on public health risk to residents. We had our first public presentation of the data that they collected last month, attracting a lot of interest, including representatives from other communities who wanted to know how they could get involved or replicate the program in their community. The work of these residents is quite impressive, and I thank all of our volunteers for all the commitment to the program as it's grown. To learn more about what they found, how we're planning to expand the program next year, and how to get involved, you can check out the WCMC webpage at WorcesterMA.gov WCMC. 
So that was a brief overview of our accomplishments in 2021. We're really proud of what we were able to get done, but there's still so much work to do. And to guide us on all this, we always come back to our water quality monitoring. And so we're gonna spend the next section of this presentation on the water quality results and challenges and how these projects are affecting our lakes. Through our networks and collaborations, we've been able to collect data at many water bodies in the city, for example, through the WCMC. But tonight we're gonna to be looking at the four core lakes and ponds in the program. Bell Pond, Coes Reservoir, Indian Lake, and Lake Quinsigamond. These are the lakes that we've been visiting consistently over the past five years and are actively managing. We sample them at the deepest points, but also in the major tributaries and at the outlets. And while we won't have a chance to review Every data point tonight, you will be able to find the full reports of each lake at WorcesterMA.gov. To help us understand the data, we're going to be using colors that represent ratings that have been assigned to ranges of results determined by the Department of, the, of Environmental Protection. On a graph, we may see a result in the uh, excellent, good, fair, or poor range represented by blue, green, orange, or red, respectively. We then take the average of those results for a lake and, um, and a rating for that parameter for the season, season with a series of um, badges of increasing quality and the same colors. After looking at the, all the data this way, we assign a state of the lake. So before we jump into all of that, I just wanna see if anyone has any questions on what we've gone over so far. And feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to talk or put any questions in the chat as well. Okay. I'm sure we'll have some more questions as we get in more into the water quality results. All right, so we will move right on. So this is Bell Pond. At 11 acres, Bell Pond is the smallest water body in the Lakes and Ponds program. It's a naturally formed 17 foot deep lake that was previously the city's drinking water supply. It's centrally located right off Belmont Street and is highly accessible to residents of Bell Hill by walking, bus, or car. It has public beach and trails that go all almost all the way around. There are sidewalks lining Belmont Street and a pier on the south end that's commonly used for fishing. Public recreational activities at Bell Pond include swimming, fishing, and hiking. There is no boating at Bell Pond. Prior to this last season in 2020, Bell Pond's water quality was ranked as excellent as it has been for the past three years prior. In 2020, there had been no closures of the beach or the lake for bacteria or cyanobacteria, water clarity was high, and there had been no sign of industrial contaminants since our last round of testing for them. At Bell Pond, um, the things we were most concerned about were invasive aquatic animals, which were first found there in 2020, as well as trash and litter, which had yet we've yet to be able to quantify. In 2021, therefore, we continue to monitor these parameters um, and we'll review for you what we found on them now. So one of the most striking features about Bell Pond is its extremely high water clarity, which is an indicator of healthy water. We measure it in several ways, the most straightforward of which is using a Secchi disc, a black and white disc, which we lower into the water until it disappears. The deeper it goes before it disappears, the clearer the water. We've graphed here the results of the disc over the course of the season, as well as the day that it rained. Rain, as we'll talk about rain later, has implications on water quality, uh, results. Secchi readings above 15 feet are considered excellent by DEP and are represented in that blue shading. Most of Bell Pond's readings were above 15 feet all season long, and in some cases we were able to see the Secchi disc as it rested on the bottom, which is about 17 feet deep. There were only two days and the clarity was below excellent, um, marked here in late June, early July. But even then, the clarity at Bell Pond was higher than at any other urban lakes and overall rated as excellent for 2021. One of the reasons that this is probably the case at Bell Pond has to do with the concentrations of nutrients in the water column. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus are the basic food sources of plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. 
The latter are microscopic organisms that can absorb nutrients really fast and then reproduce quickly. Despite their size, if there are enough of them in the water, algae and cyanobacteria can make the water cloudy and cause other challenges for the water body. For this reason, we consider them pollutants and try to stop them from coming into the waterways. We measure them too, and in Bell Pond, like in years prior, there have been very low concentrations of nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen. This graph um, has the results with the green dots representing concentrations at the surface of the water and the purple dots representing those at the bottom. While they're not zero or below, if they're not zero or below the reporting limit for the analysis, most every result falls in the excellent zone. There was just one day when the result was slightly higher in the bottom sample. And so the lake gets a score of excellent for nutrients as well. This may seem counterintuitive to some. Bell Pond is in a very densely developed part of the city and cities stress the lake out. But unlike other lakes in the city, Bell Pond is fed primarily by groundwater and has few surface water tributaries. This is an important distinction because groundwater is naturally filtered by sand and rock, which means that it enters the lake, it's low in nutrients and bacteria. Many other lakes and ponds in Worcester are connected to the storm water system, which is a collection of drains to keep rainwater from flooding the street. This water would have eventually been filtered through the ground too, but for pavement and roofs. The drain system efficiently brings the water to where it needs to go, um, for the most part, without causing flooding, but it skips that filtration step. And so we'll talk more about this later on, but for our purposes now, there are no drains that empty storm water into Bell Pond, and that is a win for the lake. When people think about contaminated waters, they're usually not thinking about nutrients, right? They're thinking about industrial contaminants like heavy metals or emerging contaminants of concern like PFAS, which might be harmful to human health. Because Worcester was a mill city and is now a biotech city, we wanted to see if there was any need to be concerned about these substances being in our waterways. So in 2019, we tested the water for almost 200 contaminants that would be associated with industry from volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds like paint and aerosols to heavy metals, petroleum products, and pesticides. We did this at Bell Pond on two separate occasions. We found that for a grand majority of these tests, nothing was detected, which is great news. We did find that there were some metals, but only those that we would expect to find naturally occurring in this geology. One thing we found were slight traces of PFAS, or perfluoroaromatic compounds, which are found in waterproofing agents and firefighting foams. However, they were not in concentrations that would be of concern even for drinking water. Many of these results were similar to what we found in other lakes as well. Given how low these results are, we did not test for them in 2020 and 2021. However, this year coming, um, we are due to have another set of these samples taken to ensure that things have not changed. Um, but for now, we do not believe that industrial contaminants are a problem in Bell Pond. Bell Pond's beach, like all the city beaches, is required to be tested regularly during the swimming season for fecal bacteria, which can make you sick. These bacteria come from any warm-blooded animal, including geese, dogs, deer, or even humans. They could come in directly from shore, or they can be brought in from the drain system that we just mentioned. The City of Worcester Department of Inspectional Services tests the water for E. coli and indicator of bacteria health during the summer months. If the results are too high, the beaches must be closed until they come down. But Bell Pond did not have any beach closures in 2021, continuing a five year streak of not having a single closure. In fact, if we were to rate all the results for bacteria testing, they would all be considered rated as excellent or good all season long. The Lakes and Ponds program did some um, bacteria testing too and found that the results were even better in the middle of the lake away from shore with 10 of the 13 samples that we took rated as excellent. So Bell Pond continues to not have any challenges with bacteria. <clears throat> so thankfully, all of those things that Bell Pond is known to do well, it continues to do well. So what about those things that we were a little more concerned about like litter and invasive animals? Invasive species are plants and animals that don't that are not native to an ecosystem and in their new home, they don't have any of those natural constraints, such as predators or environmental conditions that would help keep their populations regulated. 
This means that the plant or animal can reproduce with no constraints and quickly take over a new habitat, usually to the detriment of the local um, flora and fauna. In the case of aquatic plants, they usually crowd out all of the native plants, which provide shelter to the native fish and make swimming and boating a little more difficult. Bell Pond does not have any struggles with invasive aquatic plants, but in 2020, we did find that there was an invasive mollusk called Corbicula fluminea, and that was present throughout the pond. Apart from Bell Pond, there's only been the species has only been found in Lake Quinsigamon. While it has been known to be an aggressive force in some places, our monitoring this year indicates that it does not appear to be impeding recreation, though its effect on local mollusks is unclear. For that reason, we're going to give invasives a rating of fair for Bell Pond. We're going to continue to keep an eye on this to make sure that it does not become a bigger challenge. Litter has been cited as one of the biggest challenges at Bell Pond. Litter, or inappropriately disposed trash, is more visible at Bell Pond because of its high clarity. And it's not just an eyesore. Fish and animals that mistake plastic litter for food may not fully digest it. They can die of starvation. Um, litter can also attract vermin that carry disease, or in the case of geese, they could leave a mess on the beach. Litter can also be directly harmful to beachgoers who don't see the glass or metal in the sand and water. This year, for the first time, we used the tool developed by WPI students to quantify the litter on the beach on 12 occasions throughout the course of the season. Over the course of the summer, Bell Pond consistently scored between a 10 and 11 out of a 25 point scale, with the highest numbers typically being in the safety category and the cleanup effort. This is a visual breakdown of the litter types that were found. The most prevalent category of litter found at Bell Pond was small items with an average score of 3.7. Small items include bottle caps, small torn up food wrappers and pieces of fishing line. A separate but significant item that was prevalent was tobacco products like cigarette butts, which are a problem because they don't decompose, they don't biodegrade. This category was ranked as 3.4. Food packaging and plastic bags were also high ranking items at Bell Pond. So we're excited to have been able to begin litter quantification. We recognize this tool has some limitations and still needs to be tweaked, but we're going to start investigating possible mitigation efforts um, to make this a more useful tool for our needs. Based on what we have now, we're going to give Bell Pond Beach a rating of good with their score of 10.4. And so this brings us to the state of the lake. As expected, Bell Pond continues to do very well with a final state of excellent. This was the fifth consecutive year without a beach closure for fecal, um, for fecal bacteria or cyanobacteria at Bell Pond. Water clarity remains the highest in the city, and there were no contaminants of concern when sampled in 2019. And while we don't believe things have changed, we are due for another round of sampling. There were no reported invasive aquatic plants, and while an invasive mollusk is present, it does not appear to be impacting recreation. And we have been, finally been able to quantify and classify that litter, and it receives a good score on the present spectrum with our new tool. As we move into 2022, our goal is to continue to monitor for these water quality parameters to ensure that clarity stays high and beach closures stay low. We will do another round of industrial contaminant monitoring, monitoring and update our numbers, and we will be working on to better map and quantify the threat of the invasive mollusk. We will work to raise awareness about litter and collaborate with the community to improve the litter situation at the beach. And I wanted to just give an update on a project we've been working on to address specifically um, litter and, and, and educational efforts that were um, putting into place to address litter at Bell Pond. Previously, we've hired an underwater camera to document litter on the bottom of Bell Pond with the intention to share and raise awareness about this challenge. More recently, we launched the Blue Space Minute, an educational video series on local water quality, and I am excited to announce that we will be releasing our 2022 season premiere of the Blue Space Minute on March 1st with an episode on litter at Bell Pond. Check it out and follow the Blue Space Minute on the City of Worcester YouTube channel. And so with that, I'm wrapping up the section on um, Bell Pond. Does anyone have any questions on our data and our projects going on at Bell Pond?
we did get one more general question in the chat. Um, somebody asked if we are able to eat fish caught from any of the water bodies, and if so, which ones? Right, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so we actually are in the process of, of getting some samples analyzed for just that. Um, there are some more general recommendations made for the region about eating fish in this area, but we don't have any data specifically for Worcester at this time. Um, there were some samples taken by DEP several years ago, and they're in the process of um, reviewing that data uh, at the state level at the Department of Public Health. Um, we are also hoping to take some additional samples for cyanotoxins um, in those water bodies um, where we um, know that there are cyanobacteria. Um, and so we'll, we're hoping to be able to um, test that in, in various, various types of fish to determine if there are some fish that are more um, apt to bioaccumulate it than, than others. Um, so, um, I, I don't have more specific answer to that question just yet, but we are we are working on it because we recognize that it's something that that people are concerned about. One thing I will say is that in many of our water bodies that are stocked with trout, um, the trout are um, are stocked annually and and sometimes twice annually, and and those are raised um, in in farm environments. And so um, if if there is a fish that is at lower risk for having um, any challenges with bioaccumulation of, of, of any um, contaminants, it would probably be the trout because they're usually only, um, if you're catching them, only about a year, year or two old. Uh, so another question from the chat. When listing dates and data, uh, there was a red flag. What is this referring to? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, as we mentioned earlier, um, we were trying to be um, very um, thorough in our review of this data. And so we have a lot of quality control um, reviews that we do for all the data that we collect. And sometimes if our data is not um, meeting the quality control requirements, we will censor the data. We will remove it from the data set and basically say this isn't representative. It's not telling us, um, you know, information that's meaningful. Um, we also have data um, that comes in that doesn't meet the classification for being censored. Um, it's, it's, um, but it's still a little bit more, um, it's trustworthy, but it's it's given us some reasons to um, look at it twice. So it's flagged because um, there might be something about it that would make it um, a little less valuable than than the other data. Any other questions? All right, so we will hop into Coe's Reservoir. All right, so Coe's Reservoir was created when Tatnick Brook was dammed in the mid 1800 in order to supply water power to the Coe's Knife Factory. It's located at the end of a chain of mill ponds along Tatnick Brook and extends down from Holden. It's about 90 acres in size, and it's located between the Columbus Park and the Webster Square neighborhoods of Western Worcester. It's about 16 feet at the deepest point, which is located in the southern portion, kind of right where we are now in this photo. Coe's Reservoir is bordered on the west side by Mill Street, which has a sidewalk and is accessible by car, bus, and walking. There's a public beach as well, and a new universal access playground to the southern portion, trails around the eastern side, and the area is currently going undergoing a lot of exciting projects, including the installation of a kayak launching station at the beach and a boardwalk with a fishing pier along the eastern side. In general, over the years, Coe's Reservoir has been rated as good in regards to water quality. Prior to 2021, clarity was stable, Industrial contaminants were not a concern, and invasive aquatic plants 
um, and cyanobacteria while present were being successfully managed. However, in 2020, a few things caught our attention that we wanted to keep an eye on in 2021. First, like at Bell Pond, we did not have any data on litter. Um, additionally, in 2020, it was a rough year for Coes in terms of fecal bacteria, which caused the 13 beach closures throughout the season, which was tragic because it was such a hot summer and a lot of people wanted to swim. For that reason, it received a fair rating. Um, these high temperatures translated to higher water temperatures, which put a strain on aquatic life, and so temperature also received a fair. We will keep an eye especially on these parameters as we review this year's data. So let's see how we did. Let's first talk about temperature of the reservoir. Temperature is important because many organisms live in a narrow band of temperature and high temperatures can speed up the reproduction of organisms that cause problems like algae and cyanobacteria. With the hot summer of 2020, we saw an increased surface temperature at Coe's Reservoir. And a lot um, for a lot of the summer months, Coe's was warmer than ideal. This green line um, is the temperature at the surface of the water, and it was in the fair range for much of the season and even flirted with the poor category. This was very concerning, especially as the temperature at the bottom also seemed to rise. And the bottom is where fish retreat when the temperatures are too hot at the surface. However, this year, things were not quite so hot and the temperature stayed in what is considered the excellent range with the occasional day in the good range. This is encouraging as it means that the 2020s temp high temperatures, perhaps just an exception rather than the rule. And at least in 2021, temperature of the lake was not a concern and rated as excellent overall. Excellent for a lake, yes, but what about the brook that feeds the lake, Tatnik Brook? Coe's Reservoir, after all, is an impoundment or an artificial lake created with the damming of the stream. Tatnik Brook is a special place because it's designated as a cold water fisheries resource or a CFR, meaning that in some places it supports trout populations. This requires certain water quality conditions, especially in regards to temperature. On this chart, you can see the temperature um, of Tatnik Brook throughout the season right before it enters Coe's. The ratings you see in the background are specific for a cold water fisheries resource, and we see that the brook is in the fair range in the summer months, which is not ideal. But then we measured the temperature of the water as it left the reservoir over the spillway back into the brook. The temperature was on average 2.4 degrees warmer than when it entered the pond, occasionally bringing it into the poor category. It's natural that water would heat up when sitting in a large open space like a pond, especially a large one like Coe's, but it's important to recognize the role that these spaces play in heating up streams and the increased effect of this role they're gonna have when things get warmer. Another concern in 2020 was fecal bacteria. Prior to 2020, for three years since the lakes and ponds program had existed, there had not been a single beach closure at Coe's. In fact, all results were considered excellent or good by DEP. However, in 2020, we had to close Coe's Reservoir for 13 days, and it wasn't a particularly rainy summer either. In fact, it was dry and very hot, which just made it a shame. Visiting the beach during one of the long string of closures, this is what you might find. Goose droppings. On the sand, in the grass, and in the shallow water, it seemed that the geese were cooling off in the shallow area of the beach in the evenings and could not be bothered to use the newly renovated beach house. It was as if the, wa if the water was high for bacteria, it was very clear why. Accounts from lifeguards was that it took an hour in the morning just to remove the droppings for beach blowers, and then telling people that they couldn't even swim. Something needed to be done. Previous efforts to keep geese away using hired dogs had not made a meaningful impact, so we decided to try a new technique. Geese like to enter the beach from the water in the evening time and everyone has after everyone's cleared out. They like the beach because it's an open space. There's no obstacles between them and the water. They could retreat if a land predator approaches. Geese will generally just walk right up onto a beach from the water. This past summer, we conducted a pilot project for Coe's Reservoir. We built a short fence that could be installed at the end of the day. It didn't need to be high. Geese are a bit lazy and will not try to fly over. And if they did, they would not be interested in hanging out where they can't see clear access to the water. At the same time, the fence was low enough that people could just step over it if they wanted to enter the water. 
We worked with the parks department who trained their lifeguards to install the fence when they left after the day of work and take it down when they got there in the morning. It was a little work, but not too much more than picking up after the birds. The result, a 60% reduction in beach closures in 2021. In 2020, we had closed for 13 days in 2021, just four and really only after some very large rain events when the fence was not in use. Plus, the beach was much cleaner. Even on the days when the beach was closed, the effects of the bacteria was isolated, and samples taken in the open water generally um, all were in the good and excellent range. While it was not perfect, uh, we are very encouraged by the result of the pilot project and give bacteria a rating of good at COES. This year, we hope to improve the design of the fence to make it more user-friendly for our lifeguards, and then build enough to use at all of our beaches. As we mentioned earlier, phosphorus is one of the main food sources of cyanobacteria and considered to be a driver of cyanobacteria blooms in our lakes. Over the years, we've seen a trend at COES that while in the beginning of the summer, we see levels of total phosphorus considered excellent, they do trend ever so slightly upwards starting in July in both sampling locations. We've seen this pattern over the past few years. And while cyanobacteria can be present at safe levels in our lakes and ponds, when given the right conditions, such as nutrients and warmer water, they will reproduce quickly. At a certain point, they're able to produce cyanotoxins in levels that would be harmful to human health. The State Department of Environmental Protection has therefore created thresholds for the density of cyanobacteria cells that are found in a recreational water body before it should be closed. And that number is 70,000 cells per milliliter. We know that if we're close to this number, we know that we're, sorry, we know that we are close to this number by taking samples for cell density called cell counts to know if things become unsafe, but also to try and stop the levels from getting too high. At Coast, we can see that the level started to rise around the same time in January when clarity began to decrease. We ended up performing an algicide treatment on July 22nd, which was effective in bringing down the cell count, but between the warm water and the nutrients, it was no surprise to see the cell counts rise again. In the past, we'd assumed that the colder weather would provide the conditions for the cyanobacteria growth to peter out on its own, but it was clear that this was not the case. And for the first time, we performed a second cyanobacteria treatment at Coe's Reservoir on September 16th, avoiding any toxin production conditions. So while the threat of cyanobacteria is here and probably won't go away on its own, we do have the tools we need to keep them in check and keep our water bodies safe for recreation. For that reason, we give cyanobacteria a rating of good. Even before the Lakes and Ponds program existed, the Tatnik Brook Watershed Association was aware that Coe's Reservoir has had challenges when trying to manage invasive aquatic plants. In Coe's Reservoir, there are three that we're actively managing now, water chestnut, Eurasian milfoil, and fanwort. Unfortunately, these plants have different reproductive mechanisms and therefore require different techniques to get rid of. Over time, we've shifted our management method based on need and what we see working best in the reservoir. For example, water chestnut. This plant creates wide rosettes that float atop the water and make boating and swimming impossible. The water chestnut is found primarily in the northern part of the reservoir as seen here in the survey that we took at the end of 2020. This plant is particularly challenging because it reproduces using a nut that can survive in the lake sediment for up to 10 years. This means that even if we get rid of all the plants tomorrow, we'll see them growing back for 10 years to come. Previously, we had used a mechanical harvester, which is the equivalent of a floating lawnmower to cut back these plants before they form these seeds. Unfortunately, the large size of the infestation, along with the difficult bathymetry of the lake, made it hard for the machine to get some of the, to some of the shallow portions, meaning that we didn't always get to them in time. In 2021, we switched to an herbicide that was sprayed on the foliage of the plant, which missed less of the plants and led to the clearing of the upper portion of the reservoir for the first time in many years. We supplemented the effort with a hand pull, which took care of any plants that grew as strays in other parts of the reservoir outside the treatment area. We know that they will grow back next year and we're happy to have, a, but we are happy to have avoided a full year of reproduction by this plant. The other two plants that we've been managing at Coes are Eurasian milfoil and fanwort. 
Milfoil was previously found throughout the entire reservoir growing up feathery vines from the bottom. It reproduces by fragmentation. So we didn't just want to pull it out and risk it spreading. Fanwort was found in just one or two locations, but it's immune to many of the common herbicides available. So in 2019, we used a special systemic treatment that killed both of these plants at the roots as opposed to just the foliage, meaning that they would not grow back the following year. And it was highly successful with limited regrowth in 2020 and 2021. So we'll be continuing to monitor and respond to the challenges of um, the changing conditions in 2022. This year, we're going to give plants a rating of good because they are being effectively managed. Like at Bell Pond, litter is managed at Coes Reservoir by DPW. However, there are still some beach users um, who leave more than what they came with. Um, litter has been noted around the beach area and in, in the parks over the years. However, there was never a way to quantify and track it. So this year we applied that same tracking tool produced by WPI at Coe's Beach on nine occasions. The beach consistently scored uh, between 10 and 11 with the highest numbers typically being in the litter density category. Um, the most prevalent category found at litter, uh, the category of litter found at Coza small items with an average score of 3.8. Like at Bell Pond, tobacco products came in second with a score of 3.4. This breakdown is very similar to what we saw at Bell Pond, and, and we're going to also give it a rating of good. And so that brings us to the state of Coza Reservoir. Coes Reservoir once again receives a score of good with improvements over last year in terms of temperature with healthier ranges for the surface of the water and also bacteria with only four days of closures. The contaminants that we measured in 2019 are still standing at excellent, though, like the other places, the reservoir is due for another round of sampling. Invasive aquatic plants exist, but we're actively and successfully managing them. For the most part, they're not interfering with recreation. Phosphorus levels are not as good as we would like them to be, but an active cyanobacteria management plan has kept blooms at bay and the water safe for recreation. Overall, this category um, receives a good. And finally, we've been able to begin to classify litter and it receives a good score on the present spectrum with our new tool. But even with all these improvements, we want to see more done. In addition to continuing our baseline sampling in 2022, we want to take a closer look at cyanobacteria dynamics in the lake to determine other mitigation strategies. We also want to work on improving the goose fencing that can be installed more easily and safely by lifeguards and continue to drive down goose related bacteria closures. We will do another round of industrial contaminant monitoring to compare our results, and we're going to remap invasive aquatic plants to make sure that our management plan is working as planned and consider additional invasive plant prevention measures. Um, it's also worth noting in more detail the various partnerships the Lakes and Ponds program has made in the study of Patnick Brook. This watershed makes for a particularly interesting research site because of the increasing amount of development that the brook experiences from where it begins in Holden at our drinking water reservoirs down through Coe's Reservoir. Over the past year, we were delighted to help support research projects at three local universities that want to study the brook in various ways. Worcester State has been an active member of the Tatnick Brook Watershed Association for some time now and has recently entered an agreement with the Greater Worcester Land Trust for the use of a newly acquired site on Patch Reservoir for a research station. Concurrently, they submitted a grant to train students to collect water quality samples up and down the watershed in Patch Reservoir and Cook's Pond. The methods used will be the same as the Lakes and Ponds program, meaning that we'll be able to compare data apples to apples, which is really exciting. Um, other exciting research includes projects by Clark University, who's going to be taking samples um, in several locations up the brook in a study of how microbial communities differ throughout the watershed. And the College of the Holy Cross will be examining the stream for microplastics, which are an emerging concern in our aquatic environments. The city of Worcester is thrilled to be supporting this incredible research and looking forward to helping to share the results. So with that said, does anyone have any questions on Coe's Reservoir? We did get a question in the chat. Um, someone asked if we have shared our experiment with the low fence with DCR 
Uh, so they might be able to try it at Regatta and Lake Park. That's a great question. Um, you know, now that we've seen that it has been successful here in Worcester, we are planning on on reaching out to share those successes with DCR to see if it's something that would help them there. Anyone else? Right. So we're going to move on to Indian Lake. So Indian Lake is the largest lake fully inside of Worcester. It's also one of very few great ponds, meaning that it was naturally created at over 100 acres in size. It sits in northern Worcester with the major tributary of Ararat Brook, which enters from the north. Indian Lake's contribution to Worcester spans back at least to the Industrial Revolution when it was used to help regulate the water level in the Blackstone Canal. It's highly accessible, encircled by a 5K loop used by walkers and runners, major roads with bus routes such as Route 122A and 190. There are three public parks abutting the lake, two of which have public beaches, Shore Park, uh, beach on the north side and Clayson Beach on the east side. On the west side, there's Morgan Park, which contains a public boat ramp that is popular for anglers as well. As an urban lake, Indian Lake feels the pressures of city living. It's listed on the Massachusetts Impaired Waters 303D list as having dissolved, low dissolved oxygen um, and non-native plants and was identified as having challenges with excessive phosphorus, which have contributed to algal blooms. However, um, monitoring and management by community groups and more recently the Lakes and Ponds program has meant that we've identified and publicized potential safety concerns early on and have enjoyed water quality that has been consistently rated as good for recreation and wildlife. In 2020, no industrial or emerging contaminants had been identified and our cyanobacteria monitoring and response plan had been successful at keeping the lake bloom free and with stable clarity readings. With that said, there were several things that we were monitoring and working on to improve in 2021, including keeping an eye on surface water temperature, which like at Coe's, um, they were higher in 2020. Um, we were also looking to improve our invasive aquatic plant management plan. Um, while invasives had been successfully managed with non-chemical techniques previously, with higher water clarity, they were becoming a little bit more unruly. In 2020, there had been an increase in closures due to fecal bacteria at the beaches, and of course we wanted to quantify that litter. In 2021, we took steps to, re to remove the causes of these challenges. So let's start with bacteria. Um, it, it wasn't extre as extreme here as at Coe's Reservoir, but Shore Park Beach on Indian Lake did see an elevated number of beach closures due to E. coli bacteria in 2020 when it was closed for four days. Because like at Coe's Reservoir, we've seen a lot of goose activity on that beach, we decided to make it a second pilot site for the goose control fencing. So how did it do? In 2021, we saw two days of closures at Shore Park. The first one was after a 3 4 inch rain event. We reached out to our inspectional services team and learned that during this first event, the fence had not been put up and that the beach did have goose turds on it. On the contrary, Clayson Beach did not have a closure, though it is not known to have quite so many severe challenges with geese congregation. During the second rain event, we got close to two inches of rain, which is an extreme event that caused closures at many beaches in the area, um, regardless of goose population. So this time the fence was up at Shore Park, and while we had only one day of closures here, we had two at Clayson Beach, which was unprecedented in the time of the Lakes and Ponds program. So this can mean several things. One, the fencing at Shore Park reduced the number of goose feces that were contributing to a closure, or what is more likely, the geese may have moved to Clayson Beach, and the rain caused the effect to be more extreme on the water quality. Regardless of what's going on on shore, we found that there was never any bacteria in concerning amounts in the middle of the lake. All said and done, we believe that like at Coe's Reservoir, the fencing had a positive effect on water quality um, and at minimum was a huge win for the quality of the beaches since they were effective at keeping geese feces off the beach when they were properly put up and kept in good condition. Um, 
So with that, we're going to give Indian Lake a rating of good for fecal bacteria um, on their beaches this year. But we are going to be working on designing a higher quality goose fence because um, you could see that after a heavy rain event, the uh, the fence does take a beating and has required multiple repairs throughout the summer by those lifeguards. Some other good news at Indian Lake this year was that, like at Coes Reservoir, it was cooler than in 2020. In 2020, we saw surface temperatures in the fair to poor range in the middle of the summer, even at the bottom. While in 2021, the temperature was in a much healthier range throughout the water body and was therefore rated as good. This had good implications for oxygen levels and fish health. Fish can be stressed by warm waters and how much dissolved oxygen um, the water can hold decreases as temperature increases. Oxygen, of course, is necessary for all life, including fish and even plants. So after some small fish kills overnight in 2020, we decided to measure the dissolved oxygen in the nighttime to see if perhaps the lack of sunlight was causing there to be less oxygen in the water due to the fact that photosynthesis, which is how plants produce that oxygen, it wasn't happening at night or because the water was too warm. What we found was that while there was an expected drop in oxygen during the nighttime, it was not significant enough to cause fish kills and no fish kills were reported in 2021. This could have been a mixture of the lower temperature, less algae, a combination of the two. In any case, we have confirmed that the oxygen drop does occur during the night. Um, so if it gets too hot, it's possible that this could cause that in the future, but we now have a protocol to see if this, um, if if we do see a possible risk of this in the future. And so for 2021 though, oxygen and temperature levels were good at the lake. Um, a more nuanced story in 2021 was invasive aquatic plant management. So over the last decade, Indian Lake has had reasonable success in managing the pervasive invasive plant Eurasian milfoil using a five to four, six foot winter drawdown. A drawdown is the lowering of the water level to expose the roots of plants to the harsh winter elements to kill them off. Its efficacy though is limited to the plants that are exposed and the winter conditions. And for many years, it was enough to keep the milfoil in check, though it never eradicated it. Every summer, it would creep in from the edges of where the drawdown occurred, and by August or September, it would choke the lake until the next drawdown. More recently, we had attempted to remove these offensive plants during the summer months by the root systems using a dive team, but with limited success. In 2020, Indian Lakes water were clearer than usual, giving milfoil more of a chance to grow, and the problem became even more pronounced. Here's a map of the milfoil at the end of 2020 after the divers came to do their work. So clearly we needed another plan. We didn't want to depend on cloudy water to keep weed growth down. And so, and we also didn't want a temporary solution. And so in 2021, we used a newly approved herbicide called Procellicor. Because it's applied in the summer to the surface of the lake, it will affect all the milfoil, not the milfoil on the edges, but all of it. Um, and because it's a systemic herbicide, it kills the plant at the roots, so it's not going to grow back in the following year. The downfall is really only the price tag. Um, the investment, though, that we made on treating the milfoil was well worth it, as it was effective in reducing the population to nothing and hopefully stays that way for several years to come. So when you rid an ecosystem of invasive plants, you give room for native plants, which provide habitat for native animals to return. And in general, that's the goal. Create a balanced ecosystem that's healthy and provides recreational opportunities. And so when we first saw the pondweed, a plant native to Indian Lake, when we first saw it show itself after the treatment, we were thrilled. But then <laughs> it kept growing. Um, and it grew fast. By July, it was everywhere, thicker than the milfoil was. It was as if it felt that this was its chance to break away. Um, it was completely unexpected, not in the plan. We should note that it is not affected by the herbicide that we used on the milfoil, and it's not affected by the drawdown. 
And by the time we scheduled a treatment to control it, it was mid-August and there had been many complaints by residents who felt it was impeding boating recreation. Additionally, the biomass that was generated by this plant in the lake may have had a negative effect when it, de when it decomposed. So for this reason, we're not going to give uh, our plan an excellent this year. We're gonna give Indian Lake a good for invasive aquatic plants because while our plan worked on the invasive, the native plants did impede recreation. Um, the good news is that this plant is native and, and that these boom and bust cycles are typical for it. And it's not expected to come back as strong next year, but if it does, we now have it in our plan to respond to it. Um, Indian Lake has been known to have challenges with cyanobacteria in the past. And for this reason, the Lakes and Ponds program has developed a management plan that uses multiple indicators of cyanobacteria activity to dictate which actions to take. In the beginning of the season, we monitor total phosphorus closely um, because we know that spring rains bring it into the lake and it fuels the growth of cyanobacteria. While DEP considers points between 0.025 and 0.050 to be good, we know that this is when we begin to see the risk of cyanobacteria growth at Indian Lake. So on June 3rd, we applied our first alum treatment dose to the lake. Alums, aluminum sulfate is a compound commonly used in drinking water filtration. It's a flocculant that binds with sediments containing phosphorus in the water column and brings them to the bottom, making them inaccessible to cyanobacteria. One of the challenges with this full length treatment is that in Indian Lake, most of the phosphorus comes from outside the lake via Ararat Brook during rainstorms. This means that it does not take too long before the lake begins to see a buildup of total phosphorus again from after rain events and cyanobacteria begin to grow. Like at COES, we take samples directly for cyanobacteria. Here the results throughout the season graph compared to the closure threshold of, se of 70,000 when they are capable of producing toxins in levels that are harmful. We see that the level of cyanobacteria remain low in the beginning of the season following the alum treatment, but as time goes on, they inevitably be begin to increase in density. On July 22nd, we perform our first copper sulfate treatment or algicide treatment, which is effective in bringing the population down again um, through the city swimming season. While the numbers begin to rise at the end of August, after a rainstorm, we see lower phosphorus numbers, lower temperatures, and a decrease in cyanobacteria density. So we thought we were safe, but we were wrong. And unfortunately, we need to change the scale of our graph. In a period of eight days, numbers went from 14,000 to 105,000, crashing through the closure threshold, and we were forced to close the lake on September 13th. Once the 70,000 cell mark is hit, we must remain closed until the number drops below it naturally and we're no longer able to treat. What we were able to do, however, was test for cyanobacteria toxins, which were not found to be present in any harmful concentration, which was great news. We continued to test until the numbers became safe and eventually the lake was reopened on September 27th, the closure lasting 14 days. Obviously, no closure is acceptable, and we continue to strive to reduce the number of days that the beaches, boat ramps, and lake as a whole are affected, and know that our management was successful in, and we know that our management was successful in preventing a bloom from happening earlier in the season when it would have interfered with more recreation. However, we are working on several monitoring and management strategies that will hopefully further this cause. For these reasons, cyanobacteria gets a fair. The three parks abutting Indian Lake are managed by DPW, but Indian Lake is highly used and sometimes people do not carry out what they carry in and litter has been spotted. This year, we use the litter tracking tool to quantify litter at Morgan Park between June and November. Morgan Park scored only a little bit higher than Coes and Bell Pond with an average combined score of 11.4 with the highest scores being in litter density, um, the most prevalent category of litter found at Morgan Park um, was small items, just like the other lakes, an average score of 3.9. Like at Coe's, tobacco products came in second with a score of 3.4. This breakdown is very similar to what we saw at the other lakes and also receives a rating of good. 
So that brings us to the state of the lake. This year, Indian Lake once receives a rating of good, although there have been substantial improvements over previous year. Water temperatures were healthier at the surface and at the bottom, and our goose management seemed to work at reducing bacteria closures, although there were still day two days of closures at each beach. The contaminants we measured in 2019 still stand at excellent, although the lake is due for another round of sampling. Invasive aquatic plants were successfully managed and they received a good because this management caused an increase in population of the native plant to nuisance levels and slow response led to de decreased recreational value. Cyanobacteria management received a rating of fair. While the lake was safe for recreation for the swimming season, a late season bloom caused a 14 day closure in mid to late September. And finally, we were able to quantify litter at Morgan Park and the result was a rating of good. 2020 will be an exciting year for Indian Lake. First, we're grateful to have received a state earmark for Indian Lake with the help of Representative Jim O'Day, which will go a long way at addressing some of the challenges in the lake. Next, we'll be constructing the highly anticipated alum dosing station, which should help to improve clarity and reduce the chance of cyanobacteria blooms. We plan to improve our goose fencing and hope to install it at both beaches to ensure that the to ensure that the the reduction of the likelihood of closures related to goose feces. We will also do another round in industrial contaminant monitoring and compare our results. For invasive aquatic plant management, we're excited to say that the recent herbicide treatment has rid us of the need to perform an annual drawdown, which will have net, which have negative effects on local flora and fauna. We'll be ready to address the native pondweed, which is not affected by the drawdown with an herbicide if it grows to nuisance levels. And to ensure that this plan is working, we're going to remap invasive aquatic plants as well as consider the installation of invasive aquatic plant prevention measures. And so we're really excited to share some big progress on a project that should be a game changer for Indian Lake. We had mentioned um, that after alum treatments into the lake, phosphorus returns when rain carries it back in stormwater. The alum dosing station was designed after studies suggested that phosphorus could be more efficiently immobilized in Ararat Brook, which is a source of most of the contaminant. By applying alum here in small doses after rain events, we can use less alum and have a greater impact on increasing water clarity as well as reducing the chance for a cyanobacteria bloom. A similar project has shown excellent results in Wellesley, Massachusetts. In 2021, land for the construction was donated by the Bancroft School and the project was permitted and designed and will be out to bid next week. The hope is that a contractor will be chosen and the station will be constructed by June 1st, 2022 to mark a new stage in Indian Lakes water quality journey. Does anyone have any questions on Indian Lake? So we have a few in the chat. Um, we have one question asking about whether we see goose reproduction in our lakes um, and whether we have considered addling. Yes, so the Department of Inspectional Services does have an egg addling team and I know that they um, do go out every year and do as much addling in the nests that they know about. Some of the challenges to the egg addling projects have to do with the fact that um, some of the nests are on private property. Um, the addling program obviously is restricted to properties where they have permission to access so city properties. Um, however, if you do know that you have a goose nest on your property, you can contact the Department of Inspectional Services and they will come and addle the eggs. Uh, we have another question asking if there are any unintended or undesirable implications to treating with alum, copper, or other things, such as causing imbalances in over weight, overall weight chemistry. Yeah, that's definitely um, something that we think about. Um, and, and previously, that is something that that had been a problem. Um, these days, there are a lot stricter limits on the concentrations that you're allowed to add of a lot of these compounds um, because of that concern. Um, up to this point, we haven't seen anything in our regular testing to to suggest um, that the benefits don't outweigh the costs. Um, but it's something that we're constantly learning more about and, and want to make sure that we stay ahead of because we don't want to have those unintended consequences. 
we have another question. Will the drawdown be discontinued? That's a great question. So the drawdown is a tool that has been used for a long time at Indian Lake. And um, during a period, it was really the only tool that was available for um, combating the, the invasive aquatic plants. Um, these days we have a larger arsenal um, and because we are able to um, expand our strategy and, and use more effective methods, um, we currently don't need to use the drawdown. Um, the drawdown is, is really just for invasive aquatic plant management. Um, and so we are able to give the lake a little bit, a, a much needed break, quite frankly, for, from the drawdown. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that we won't use it again. It's a really um, great method in many ways. It's cheap. Um, and easy to implement, especially at Indian Lake. Um, it's just a matter of what um, our current management plan calls for. So it's not impossible that we will do it again. Um, but um, at least for next year, we don't plan on doing a drawdown. I have another question asking if the alum dosing, alum dosing station uh, is where the runoff from the neighborhood was. If the alum dosing, so um, the alum dosing station will not necessarily be um, intercepting runoff. It's going to be applying alum to the brook. Um, so I don't believe that there were any um, catch basins that or outfalls that were on that parcel. Um, so there, I don't believe that there was previous outflow coming from that particular parcel, but it will be treating air at Brook, which does receive storm water from um, several outfalls upstream. Okay, we have another one about the alum dosing station. Is the dosing station automated or manual? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what's exciting about this dosing station is that we are going to be um, creating a, an automatic um, switch that runs by rain gauge and so the idea is that we're going to calibrate it so that when it rains a certain amount it will switch the pumps on um, so it will be automatic in that sense um, there's also going to be um, an application created so that we will be alerted whenever it goes on and off and how long it was on for and the estimated amount of um, alum that was added so um, we're very excited about what this means for the lake and we have another question asking, can we encourage the health department to expand their geese peace program with our city investing millions into our parks, playgrounds, and open space areas? It will reduce toxic wastes from these investment areas, adding our ponds to that list. I think we could encourage, um, <laughs> as, as residents, we could um, definitely encourage. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with, um, with the, um, how that program is being managed through the Department of Inspectional Services. Um, but the more that we can stop the reproduction of the geese, the, yes, that's very true. It will help our, uh, our water bodies. And that's everything in the chat. All right, thanks, Nick. That was great. Um, so this brings us to our final and largest lake monitored and managed um, by the city of Worcester, the lake and our lakes and ponds program. It's Lake Quinsicaman. It's over 750 acres in size and up to 85 feet deep. This natural lake is one of the first things that people see when they enter Worcester from the east. The lake is abutted and well used by Worcester, but also Shrewsbury and Grafton and routinely holds events that people that bring people from near and far to fish, to row, to swim, to water ski, dragon boat race, sail, and really any other water based activity that you can imagine on the lake. You can access the lake from several locations. The State Department of Conservation and Recreation has two parks with swimming beaches in Worcester and a boat ramp managed by Shrewsbury on the eastern side of the lake. There are also multiple informal um, access areas for people who want to use this amazing resource. The Lakes and Ponds program began regular monitoring of the lake in 2017 to collect data on nutrients, bacteria, and cyanobacteria, which have been identified as threats to lake health. 
Over the years, the program has given water quality at Lake Quinsigamon a rating of good up through 2020. That year, similar to the other lakes, um, there were no concerns about industrial or emerging contaminants. And while there were invasives present in the lake, um, they were either not threatening recreation, as in the case of invasive animals, or they were being managed effectively by the Lake Quinsigamon Commission. The thing that we were keeping an eye on in 2021 was cyanobacteria. While it did not seem to be a concern in the summer months, there were some blooms present under the ice and in the, in the winter. In 2020, Lake Quinsigamon did have challenges with fecal bacteria, causing high numbers of beach closures, especially at Regatta Point. There are also some sensitive temperature dynamics that occur in the lake um, that we want to keep our eye on. And so we wanted to, um, we also wanted to begin to quantify that litter. So one thing that surprised us this year was Lake Quinsigamon's clarity. After Bell Pond, Lake Quinsigamon is usually the second highest, has the second highest clarity of the Worcester Lakes and pretty consistently throughout the year. This year we saw something different. We saw them when we saw things happening differently in each of the two basins where we sample. Um, usually Lake Quinsigamon clarity stays in the good range, but in 2021, both in the north and south basins, this year we saw an unusual dip in clarity in the summer months before returning in fall. In the northern basin, the clarity stayed in the good category through December, though in the south basin, it dipped again. While still higher clarity in, than in many lakes in the area, these unexpected dips give Lake Quinsigamon a rating of fair for clarity. Um, what could be causing this? Um, this year, we had some additional tools to find out. In 2021, we had put out some new continuous monitoring sensors in each basin um, of two of the large uh, basins of Lake Quinsigamon. These solar powered units have the ability to collect um, indicators like phycocyanin, which is a pigment used um, by cyanobacteria to obtain energy. When we mapped um, phycocyanin with our SECI instruments, we, with our SECI measurements, we saw something very interesting. In the high summer, when clarity is low, there's a lot more phycocyanin in the water. At one point, there was so much, we even decided to take a cyanobacteria cell count, which we usually don't do in Lake Quinsigamon. And we found that there were indeed cyanobacteria present. While they never got high enough to cause concern, we're going to be keeping a closer eye on them in the future. Another parameter that our sensors detect is water temperature. We decided to see how it did when match it against its readings and match its readings up against our manual temperature measurements. Here are our results that we took twice monthly. Temperature was in between the excellent and good rating zones this past season, which is an improvement over 2020. Results from the continuing monitoring buoy were similar, confirming that our sensors are in good working condition and that Lake Quinsigamon has improved over 2020, receiving a good um, rating for temperature. Um, but we're worried in late, um, we're worried about temperature in Lake Quinsigamon because, like in Tatnick Brook, it's the home of some cold water species like rainbow trout. Trout like water temperatures below 20 degrees Celsius, anything much higher than that, and they become a bit stressed. Thankfully, Lake Quinsigamon is deep and they can move down to the colder water if it gets warm on the surface. But trout also need higher levels of oxygen too, more than four milligrams per liter. And we see at the surface of Lake Quinsigamon that we have plenty of this oxygen, but at the bottom, we have much less. So what's it like in between? How far down can fish go before they hit areas of low oxygen? To answer this question, we take lake profiles. We sample temperature and oxygen at the surface and in five foot increments going all the way down to the bottom. And the chart looks like this. Depending on the type of gear, these lines could look very different, meaning different amounts of fish habitat. Here's a series of these graphs taken over the course of six months in the North Basin. But what do we make of these? It's just like a lot of lines. Um, first, we determine where oxygen levels are below four milligrams per liter where this yellow line intercepts the blue line for oxygen reading. This depth is the depth below which there's not enough oxygen for trout and where they prefer not to go. Essentially, it's unavailable. You see that throughout the first half of the season, the warming months, this depth decreases. This is because oxygen is being used up on the bottom and due to the warm water on top, more oxygen rich water cannot mix in. As the water cools, this reverses. So all the water above this is good for fish. All that white space is good for fish. 
all until it warms up past 20 degrees. If we draw these lines and shade above where they intersect the red line, We see that there's increasing heat stress as the summer warms up, pushing fish lower into the water column. And we see what's happening here in August is what we're most curious and concerned about. It's called the squeeze. And this is when the habitat is most unfavorable to fish on either side, and when we would expect a fish kill to occur if one were to happen. Another thing we're interested in is when both of these lines are straight again, um, like they are here in December. Um, this is when the lake is freely mixing oxygen and other nutrients up and down the water column and is unimpeded by thermal masses. You could also see here that there is a lot of more oxygen in the water. For the first time this year, we perform profiles like that at both sites that we sample in the open water. So this is the south site, and we found that the phenomenon also occurs here. And um, it's important to know since we found high levels of nutrients in the water column in the southern basin. What does that mean? Um, so we've seen how thermal dynamics in Lake Quinsigamon have affected oxygen levels, causing fish to be stressed. These same dynamics may also be promoting those late season cyanobacteria blooms. While phosphorus at the surface of Lake Quinsigamon is not a challenge during the summer months, you see here the green dots are all in the excellent range. All of the blue dots, which represent phosphorus at the bottom of the lake, are really high at the tail end of the season and then decrease again, almost like the oxygen. The phosphorus isn't just going away, it's being transported to other areas of the water column or being consumed. And especially in the southern portion of the lake may be contributing to these low clarity levels in the winter months. Another concern we had at Lake Quinsigamon was with fecal bacteria. Lake Quinsigamon's two main beaches, Regatta Point and Lake Park are managed by the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation but need to abide by the same rules to test their beaches for bacteria. In 2020, due to the pandemic, there was a shortened beach season, which was a blow to recreation. On top of that, Lake Park was closed due to bacteria exceedances eight of those days and Ricotta Point, 40 of those days. Um, 2021 was better mostly because the season was a month longer. Lake Park was closed for bacteria only six days, and Regatta Point was curiously not closed at all during this time, but in total was closed for 35 days, including almost all of July. This is certainly a blow to recreation on Lake Quinsigamon, but it is important to know that these high numbers are not occurring everywhere. I mean, just look at between those two graphs and how different they were. Um, we take E. coli samples in the middle of the lake, and those numbers are generally coming back very low, generally in the excellent to good category and well below the recreational threshold. So this indicates that any bacteria that are entering the water from the shore are dissipating or dying before they reach the middle of the lake. Regardless, the closures of our recreational spaces for this amount of time is unacceptable, and Lake Quinsigamon receives a rating of fair for bacteria. We'd like to work more closely with DCR and perhaps share some of our goose fencing technology with them um, to help get this problem under control. Being such a large water body, it's no surprise that people come from far and wide to use Lake Quinsigamon, and for this reason, it's especially vulnerable to invasive aquatic plants and animals who can travel as hitchhikers on boats and trailers. Remnants of Corbicula fluminea, or the Asian clam, has been noted in Lake Quinsigamon for several years now, especially in the northern portion of the lake. While they have not yet been impeding recreation, recent studies suggest that this mollusk could be selectively filter feeding on algae that compete with cyanobacteria, allowing the bacteria to prosper. More research is needed to ultimately know what the impact of this mollusk will have. When it comes to invasive plants, Lake Quinsigamon has those as well. A 2018 invasive plant survey found six invasive aquatic plants throughout the lake. The Lakes and Ponds program supports the Lake Quinsigamon Commission in implementing the invasive plant management plan for the lake. Some challenges that they face, some challenges that they face have to do with a rare plant that has been found in the central portion of the lake, making the applications of herbicides a trickier process. As the different options are being reviewed, the northern and southern portions of the lake are being treated with herbicides. 
In 2021, Half Moon Cove, which has been choked with Eurasian milfoil, was treated with Priscillacore, the same treatment that we used on Indian Lake. Additionally, five acres of Flint Pond were also treated for fanwort and milfoil, though the procurement challenges pushed this treatment to the very end of the season. During 2021, too, a new massive, uh, a new invasive aquatic plant was identified at several locations throughout the lake, the water chestnut. And because Lake Quinsigamon is so big and because it has um, been so long since we've had our last survey, it's not easy to know exactly the extent of the challenge of the invasive aquatic plants. But the Lakes and Ponds program is committed to contracting a new study for invasive aquatic plant mapping in 2022 to help guide management in the future. In the meantime, between the mollusks and the plants, Lake Quinsigamon receives a fair rating for invasives. When it comes to litter, Lake Quinsigamon is even harder to quantify being such a large water body with so many abutters. But one very large abutter is DCR which manages Regatta Point and Lake Park, we decided to track litter at Lake Park over the course of the 2021 sampling season. And over the 11 days that we visited the park, the average litter condition score was 9.9. .9. The below 10 score was driven by several days when at a glance scores were one or when litter was not even noticeable. Of all of, um, of the little, little that was there, it was made up primarily of small items and tobacco products with food packaging coming in third. And while scoring slightly better than the other lakes, the below 10 score gives Lake Quinsigamon a rating of excellent for litter at Lake Park. The state of Lake Quinsigamon in 2021 is good, though it is slipping in some parameters. Water temperature has improved over 2020, though oxygen stress is still a concern. There were fewer beach closures due to bacteria, but not significantly. Although it seems bacteria in the middle of the lake is not a concern, the impact to recreation due to closures gives it a rating of fair. Um, thankfully, even with all the uses of the lake, we have not found any need to worry about industrial contaminants, though we are due for another round of testing for them. Invasive aquatic plants were not heavily managed this year in the lake with challenges due to lack of un, um, of not updated maps. The fact that the challenge has gotten away from us, um, we're going to give it a fair. Clarity was lower than usual, and while we didn't see any winter blooms, we're going to look a little closer at this in the future. And finally, um, litter has been quantified using this rubric at Lake Park and receives a score of excellent. But we couldn't leave the 2021 state of the lakes without talking about an event that actually happened in early 2022. On the morning of Sunday, February 6th of this month, sewer operations staff responded to an alarm at the Lake Ave pump station to find the parking lot flooded and spilling into the lake. Further inspection, show, inspection showed that the dry well, which is where the four pumps were located, was full of water and pumps were stopped. Crews worked around the clock to pump out the dry well um, and restart one of the pumps. And with a little luck, they got one working, but only after about 36 hours. While the details of why this happened are still under investigation, preliminary reports about the event and the response can be found on the City of Worcester webpage. DPWMP alerted city officials and the Lakes and Ponds program within an hour of learning of the event, and we made sure to get in touch with the Lake Association, the Commission, as well as the Town of Shrewsbury, who spread the word in their networks. All said and done, 5.75 million gallons of untreated race, wastewater entered Lake Quinsigamon, and it would have been more if not for a fleet of tanker trucks hauling what they could through the night to the treatment plants. We created a plan to assess potential ramifications to public health and wildlife. The Department of Inspectional Services put out a health advisory to the southern portion of the lake. We know that wastewater contains fecal bacteria, organic waste with nutrients in it, as well as other compounds of concern that are flushed down the toilet. And unfortunately, excuse me, and ultimately we teamed up with inspectional services to sample for E. coli, total phosphorus, ammonia, nitrate, dissolved oxygen, metals, and other contaminants to see if they were cause for concern. Um, Ice cover made the process a little more challenging, especially in the area right around the incident, which of course um, was a little more melted due to the fact that sewer water is a little bit warmer than ice. Um, we reached out to Mass Wildlife, 
who responded that there was no guidance for sampling in these conditions and we worked together to make a plan. On this diagram, we are in the middle of the lake looking north to the Route 9 bridge. And so we chose sites um, based on the lake's characteristics to assess the breadth of the impact. We sampled just north of the bridge, right near the pump station, a bit further south, and then again across from Lake Park, which on this uh, with this picture would be behind us. Um, so in addition to almost daily sampling, the Department of Inspectional Services is conducting this from land. Um, Lakes and Ponds collected samples through the ice on Thursday, February 10th, Friday the 11th, Monday the 14th, Thursday the 17th, and then after the 17th, the ice was no longer reliable for access. Um, as soon as the water opens up, we do plan on returning to continue taking samples, and that will most likely happen next week. So all this data will be published in a report that will be available on the Lakes and Ponds webpage. However, we do have some initial results to share tonight. First, the oxygen profiles. Dissolved oxygen was a big concern for us because we know that Lake Quinsigamon has is stressed for oxygen in the summer months. But as we saw in previous slides, unlike in the summer, dissolved oxygen levels are generally higher in the winter, most likely because the water is colder and there's less metabolic activity or organisms using the oxygen. Would this import input of organic matter change that by fueling bacteria and algal growth? So far, thankfully, no. These results um, from the profiles and the oxygen readings that we were taking at the sites I just mentioned, oxygen levels do not dip below 10 milligrams per liter at any point in our sampling. Um, they're generally above 11, and, and this especially happens in the later days of sampling. So that's great news. Um, total phosphorus is one of the factors that would drive the processes that we're looking for here. And so we wanted to know if that was elevated we did see that around the pump station that we had um, some elevated numbers somewhere in the red zone, the poor zone, but it seems to not be as elevated above normal levels out in the middle of the lake. This is something that we'll be continuing to keep an eye on as time goes on and the warmer weathers and the microbes are more uh, active. But at this initial look, it shows that, that at least away from the pump station, things are dissipating quickly, thankfully. Um, so finally, we have those bacteria samples. Um, while lakes and ponds sampled bacteria in the open lake, inspectional services took samples at the pump station. So in the open lake, um, we saw that there were um, that there were some elevated levels of bacteria, especially in the site directly north of the pump station, as well as right in front of it. These levels, while higher than usual in the summer months, they do not exceed the recreational threshold thresholds. Um, so further south in the lake near the Marine Corps and Lake Park, there was no elevation in bacteria levels. At the pump station itself, inspectional services took their first round of samples on Wednesday after the bypass to the lake had ceased. Um, the results were um, 330 CFUs. And while that's above the recreational threshold, it's not that much above it. It's only about um, 100 CFUs above it. Um, this, this gave us a lot of hope that things would go as expected and that the bacteria would die off pretty quickly outside the body of a warm-blooded host. But as they continued sampling over the next few days, they saw something really odd happening. The numbers started to increase, um, even when there was no more sewage inputs from the station. And after a few days of this, the sewer division began an upstream investigation of an outfall near the station and discovered that there was actually a sewer line clogged um, that had been um, that had been causing a discharge through this outfall. And so it was cleaned up on Friday the 18th, and we saw that the number began to come back down immediately. Um, and so I'm pleased to announce that the most recent numbers from sampling yesterday that came in today show that the results by the pump station are now within the recreational limit for swimming. Um, we will be continuing to monitor the longer term effects of this event on the lake and continue to provide updates through our website and through the lake associations and commission. Additionally, in 2022, we hope to keep a closer eye on these cyanobacteria dynamics at Lake Winsigamon and utilize some of our new technology to get more direct measures of this threat and how it might change in the future. To address bacteria, we're reaching out to DCR to see if they're interested in trying out our goose fencing. We're going to be performing new rounds of industrial contaminant sampling, this time with some extra wastewater related parameters. 
um, we're also going to be conducting an invasive aquatic plant mapping, sir, um, mapping so that we can chart a longer term path with invasive plant management. Um, does anyone have any questions on Lake Quinsigamond? No? Okay. Well, with that, we'll hop into our, our exciting previews of 2022. Um, so despite some setbacks, it was a year of tremendous growth for the Lakes and Ponds programs, and we accepted the challenges to increase in our monitoring and our outreach. And while I feel like we've come a long way, as you can see, there is still so much work to do. And not just at these four water bodies, but at many other water bodies throughout the city. Now that we're part of the Department of Sustainability and Resilience, we have spent some time thinking about the role of our blue spaces in a greener Worcester, their importance for making Worcester a more attractive city to live in and recreate in, but also as producers of ecosystem services for an increasingly warm and wet future. Not only is protecting these resources important for keeping these services maintained, but making sure that they're accessible to those who are most impacted by climate change, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. So this winter, we spent some time creating an actionable plan for our growth to continue to rise to these challenges. We've created a blue space plan of sorts. Um, this includes technological updates to our current monitoring program, increased invasive aquatic plant prevention, and so on, cyanobacteria monitoring and response, more outreach, more education, more community um, engagement, we want to expand the lakes and ponds program, have more lakes involved, and increase our overall capacity. But we've heard about plans that have been created in shells, and we didn't want this to be just an exercise in visioning. So that's why we were so excited to announce that the Department of Sustainability and Resilience has been allocated $2.5 million in ARPA funding to implement the Green Worcester Plan to respond to the negative economic impacts from the pandemic that are causing people to utilize our local public spaces more. And we plan to expand the Lakes and Ponds program using this vision as a guide. And while federal funding means Maybe jumping through a few hoops, we do expect that this will have an immediate effect on the program starting in 2022. We plan on using some of these funds to replace aging monitor equipment so that we can continue to bring high quality data from the 4 existing lakes we've been monitoring. We also plan on purchasing 2 new continuous water quality monitoring buoys like we have on Lake Quinsigamond and placing them in Coes Reservoir and Indian Lake in order to better track the threat of cyanobacteria blooms there. Our goal is to get these dashboards public so that anyone who wants to see the results can and in real time. We plan to we plan on performing diagnostic studies on additional lakes in Worcester to determine what is necessary for management at these spaces. And based on these results, expect to at, add at least four additional lakes to the Lakes and Ponds program in 2023 with a plan to continue to add more lakes in the future. Lakes added to the program will be managed for invasive aquatic plants, cyanobacteria, as well as any other threats to their ecosystem services. Understanding that this process won't be immediate, and the growing concerns around cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins, we will be increasing cyanobacteria monitoring eternally and through the Worcester Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative. This past year, the City of Worcester Water Division invested in new technology that promises to help us perform cell counts in a faster and cheaper way than we were currently able to. We hope to leverage this new technology and take more samples at more at our um, at our current four lakes and add another sampling date to the WCMC calendar every month to make sure that we can predict and alert people to blooms in all WCMC lakes. If a bloom does occur, we will be performing more toxin analysis to determine the safety of using a water body as well as providing faster updates to the WCMC website. Over the past few years, there have been huge investments planned and constructed around places like Lake Quinsigamon and Coes Reservoir. We want to keep this momentum going. And that's why over the next few years, we want we hope to begin to study how we could continue to improve the use of these spaces for more activities in a safe way. Because all improvements are made for the benefit of all Worcester residents, we want to make sure that all residents are able to access them and we'll be working with the Department of Sustainability to develop a mobility plan to bring people to and between our blue and green spaces.
Worcester is a unique place for so many reasons. One big one being the blue spaces that we have, not just for their increase, not just because they increase quality of life, but providing these ecosystem services that are more and more necessary in a changing world. There is a lot to do and we can't do it alone. We need to continue to work with our community partners, the watershed associations, local universities and nonprofits, state government agencies, our city representatives, and to end with you, our residents. If you are looking for more ways to get involved, one direct way is to join the WCM which has a volunteer training and information session coming up on April 7th. I encourage you all to check out the pages of your local watershed associations who are incredible resources and advocates for our lakes. They're also planning, there are also openings on several boards and commissions that have direct impact on the decisions about these spaces. Our local lakes and ponds are our local responsibility. So at the very least, I encourage you all to talk to your local representatives and tell them where you stand, learn where they stand, and vote in your local elections. As always, please, please feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions. This is my email. And thank you all so much for coming out tonight, this evening, and for your continued support of our blue spaces. And I guess I'll take a few more questions if there are some. So there was one question that came in uh, in the chat. Um, they asked, it was stated in the water uh, temperature of Tatnik Brook was 2.4 degrees higher. There has been a block missing from the recently repaired Patch Reservoir Dam for a couple of years, resulting in the Patch Reservoir water level being about a foot lower. The lower water level is likely contributing to the water higher water temperature of Tatnik Brook where it flows into Patch Reservoir. Will the missing block be replaced? It, uh, do you know when? That's a great question and I had been alerted um, to that concern and I will have to follow up on that. Um, I did not realize that that was still an issue, but thank you for letting me know. Well, with that, I, I'd like to thank you all um, for coming out tonight and, and, and continuing to come out even, even to virtual state of the lakes. And I hope to see you all out there as it gets warmer on the lakes as well.